you think life is simpler as time evolves? For some, it can be more complicated when facing issues about health, estate plans, probate, long-term care, and more. That's why attorney CPA Joe Cordell hosts Elder Talk with Tucker Allen, providing intelligent answers for those thinking about their future. Here's attorney CPA Joe Cordell. Welcome to another episode of Elder Talk. We want to continue discussion, as we had in the last episode, about estate planning. I mean, it's fitting that we're around the beginning of the year, so it's an opportunity for us to think about whether we have in place what we want to have in place. And those of you who've even done planning in the past may still wonder, do I need to make some changes? Obviously, those among you who've done no estate planning, I think you should clearly get the message that... There are so many advantages to doing planning that it doesn't make sense to not do it. I mean, the advantages far outweigh the costs associated with it. And I would say this even if I weren't a lawyer. We think that in the second episode, though, we'll focus, we'll continue talking about estate planning, but we want to focus a little more on the tax side. Now, some of you might yawn at the suggestion that we're going to be talking a little bit about taxes. I'm going to try my best to make this interesting and relevant to you. But let me start out by by discussing kind of a tour of the horizon about what the situation is with taxes as it pertains to estate planning. So, Jill, are we ready to dive in this week in this discussion? And we have with us a guest that hopefully everyone will recognize. Shall you introduce, reintroduce? It would be my pleasure. Yes, we have Missy Shans Manning, an attorney with Tucker Allen. She's been with us many times, and she really, really has a good grasp on this subject of taxes associated with estate planning. And Missy, I remember the first segment of this show, um, New Year's Resolutions, that uh, you see more people calling at the beginning of the year wanting to do estate planning. It's part of their New Year's resolution. Yes. So we receive quite a few phone calls at the start of every year about people interested in setting up an estate plan. And also they tend to have questions about how taxes will impact their estate plan or how their estate plan will impact their taxes. Taxes is something that none of us want to deal with. It tends to, uh, you know, make a lot of us nervous. And that's why we tend to go to a professional, someone that can really tackle that. Yeah, and and I think that um, that a lot of that nervousness comes from the unknown. I mean, we're transitioning now to an administration whose philosophy regarding taxes is very different from the philosophy of the outgoing administration. So Biden, we know, is more tax friendly. We know that he's talked about the fact that he he will raise taxes. I don't think anyone questions that. We know that Biden will introduce probably an increase in the rates for ordinary income. We think that's coming. There's been talk about capital gains. We think that that he has a philosophy that that capital gains should not have a different rate of taxation than ordinary income. And right now, there's a huge difference. I mean, somebody might be paying ordinary income, state and federal, north of 40 percent, and they might find that for capital gains that they're currently at around 20. So if you saw that sort of change, that would be dramatic. Similarly, with corporate taxes, we know that that the Biden administration has said that they intend to reintroduce a corporate tax. Now, we don't know if they'll really do that because while it has certain street appeal to talk about that, the reality is that it's so disruptive to the expectations now that the market has about corporate taxes that if you go back, then the market is going to adjust you know, people's 401ks accordingly. So people will find that the values of their 401k just went down overnight some significant percent because we know that when the investors realize that their net take home after they, they pay their taxes is less, then they're going to adjust their valuation of the, uh, of the businesses that they're investing in. So we want to, though, focus more today, I think, and talk a little bit about these taxes as they may relate to estate planning. And you know what I want to know, since this, of course, isn't my area of expertise, um, how are trusts taxed? Well, do you want to take that, Missy? Sure. So um, there's a lot involved in figuring out how trusts are taxed. Obviously, you should talk to a CPA about your exact situation, but I can give you the ballpark general overview. So it largely depends upon if it's a revocable trust or an irrevocable trust um, and if the grantors are still alive. So if you're the person who set it up, if you're still alive, um, if you set it up with your spouse, is your spouse still alive? 
um, all the good stuff like that. Um, for most of our clients at Tucker Allen who set up a revocable trust with us, um, while they're alive, they pay their taxes at their personal income tax rate. So even if the trust owns their investment account or their house or something like that, um, all of the income from that is reported on their regular 1040s. There's nothing special about it. Um, after someone passes away who has a revocable trust, then at that point, taxes do become a little bit different. They're going to need to get an EIN number from the IRS and pay trust tax rates on any income received in the trust name over $600 each year. Now, does that apply to the beneficiaries are you talking about after the person passes away? The trustee, the successor trustee, the person who manages the trust, that person's going to be handling paying the taxes for the trust. Oftentimes, a lot of that income that a trust will receive will be passed on to the beneficiaries, and they would pay that at their own personal tax rates. And that's true. We probably should take a little bit of a step back. I'm afraid that everyone's not following us. And our goal on this show is to is to not make this a technical discussion. That drives me nuts when I watch, for example, investment shows, and they're using even phrases that I don't know. <laughs> and I can imagine that that an average listener who doesn't have a CPA or whatnot is not going to follow it well. So let's simplify this discussion. The whole idea in creating a revocable trust, among other things, is to create an entity that you still have full control over. That's what people like about revocable trust is they still have full control. They can reach in and change anything they want when they want. Because of that, it means that it's not a separate taxable entity. Um, if you think about the principle, it kind of makes sense. The IRS is saying, look, if you're wanting to, to create a separate taxable entity, then you can't have the ability to control it with indifference. In other words, it can't be your alter ego that's a phrase that's used in some of the court cases. It can't simply be um, a device for you to artificially create a separate taxable entity that presumably would have a lower tax rate, for example, than you would have. Uh, everyone would do that, and it'd be the best of all worlds. They control it willy-nilly. They have no, no practical distinction between the way they handle it before they transfer their assets and how they handle them after they transfer their assets. So, so the IRS, for the most part, says, look, if you're going to have a separate taxable entity, there has to be a meaningful loss of control. There, there has to be a true ownership, in other words, on the part of this entity. And that includes corporations, trusts, et cetera. So um, CPAs and tax lawyers being the creative people that they are, believe it or not, they have developed over the decades ways in which to get around this to some extent, but not fully. So uh, they'll create, for example, an irrevocable trust, which uh, from the sound of it, you would think, well, that is a separate entity because if it's irrevocable, then it means you have less control over it. And, and that's true. So the general rule of thumb would be that if you had an irrevocable trust, that you, you probably would be creating a separate taxable entity. So a lot of our clients are uncomfortable with that idea, and there are other reasons to have some discomfort with an irrevocable trust, uh, at least for many people. Now, a lot of our clients do have irrevocable trust, and for them it's a marvelous idea. But it does mean that, that you have to think about the tax implications. Now, I'm going to add one other couple of sentences here that at the risk of totally confusing you, uh, I just feel obligated to insert this qualification, and that's that you can create an irrevocable trust that's designed to fail to be an independent taxable entity. And I won't get into that, uh, but it is a technique that estate planners can do. So for those people who want the advantages of an irrevocable trust, but they don't want to have to deal with a separate taxable entity, then there is a way to do that. But we won't get into that on this show. So whenever we do for our clients a revocable trust, which even for the clients we do irrevocable trust for, typically we, we do a revocable trust. Whenever we do the revocable trust, then we don't have to think about the tax implications because uh, it's treated from the IRS's perspective as simply an extension of yourself. So it makes your filing return and doing everything else very simple. So is it fair to say that each of these types of trust have their own um, unique tax requirements, would you say? Yeah, you need to think about taxes, put it that way, with, with any type of trust you do. And, and some people have a goal that they want to create a separate entity to be taxed because they figure the tax rates are lower. 
Uh, so, so often they will, they will have a trust that's designed to be taxable, which is easy to do. Uh, but others don't want that complication. I'd probably even say most of our clients probably uh, prefer to, to not have the complexity of dealing with a separate taxable entity. Now, what if you name a charity as a beneficiary? Um, will this be, provide a tax benefit to the grantor? Oh, absolutely. You'd have to be careful about how you set things up. You'd want to make certain that you consult with a licensed attorney and a CPA to make certain that all of your I's are dotted and all your T's are crossed. So that way you're getting the maximum amount of um, tax offset that you can. But it's always a good idea to um, use charities as a way to offset your tax burden. I hurry to tell people, though, when we're talking about this, it rarely is a transfer like that a profitable transaction. Was that... Meaning that the IRS has been has been all over this issue, and they have they have foreclosed a lot of the ways in which you can transfer something and make money on it. Uh, for example, at one time, people would take an asset that that perhaps they couldn't sell for a uh, hundred thousand dollars. Maybe they thought its real value was going to end up being fifty thousand or less. And let's assume they're in a very high marginal tax bracket. Well, they would make a gift of it. And they would have an appraiser appraise it liberally, not fraudulently, but but liberally, we'll say, and appraise it above the $100,000 even. And so they would end up with such a huge deduction given their high tax rate that they actually made more money than if they had had sold it at the real price it would have sold for and paid taxes on it. So um, those, those opportunities generally don't exist. But like Missy said, for people who are... I would say charitable-minded, people who, who really want to give to something and except for something very punitive in the tax system would, would definitely give things. And so the IRS wants to sort of pave the way for them and this, our society wants to pave the way for them that if they're at all inclined to give, let's give them what encouragement we can. And in that sense, you can find it very efficient to give things away and get tax benefits. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, um, an estate and gift tax, does that really only apply to the very wealthy? We're not talking about the middle class, correct? Missy, explain how kind of the history of this and where we are in terms of tax rates. Sure. So um, reaching back to like 1997, I know that the estate tax threshold was set at around $600,000. Now, let me back up and explain. An estate tax threshold is the amount of money that your estate has to be valued at in order to to get hit with is an additional tax, sometimes called a death tax. So if you had an estate that was worth $700,000 back in the 90s, um, that was over the $600,000 threshold. So that extra $100,000 there would be taxed at a higher rate. So, I mean, your point, though, is that um, it's, uh, it's a pretty harsh rate, and it kicked in at a pretty low level, 600000 bucks. It's hard for me to believe that even now in the late 90s. And I was doing estate planning then, and I've, I've since forgotten because it's gone up so much, and it did so so quickly in the 2000s. Mm-hmm. So things jumped up pretty substantially. Um, today, we're obviously at $11.7 million for a single person. And if their spouse is savvy and takes advantage of it, they can double that amount. Um, by filing. 22 million bucks. Yep. So, so now, does that tie in with President Trump in uh, 2017 with the uh, Tax Cuts and Jobs Act? Yes. So, um, and it changed that exemption. Is that correct? Yes, it did change that amount. It has gone up since then um, to the current $11.7 million. Yeah. And wow. S- yeah, he increased it, but, but the change that he made. Um, has an expiration date. So it the expiration date, I think, is 2025. Yeah. Uh, but, but when it expires, it doesn't go all the way back down to 3.5 million, for example, which is what it was before this, this large increase. Uh, but it does go down significantly. And, and what Biden administration has talked about is they've talked about lowering this to 3.5 million and to go with, was it a 45% rate? Correct. Yeah, 45% rate. So uh, even though some people are thinking, well, I'm good. I'm not going to be anywhere near the 3.5 million. Um, but I, 
two things. Number one is 45% is a really brutal rate to have to pay. I mean, it's like losing half of what you leave your family or your loved ones. Um, but the other point, though, is that people shouldn't rest on their laurels that $3.5 million is something that that is assured them. Um, I think that there is a lot of political will now to to go after money that's passed down. For a long time, this was a sacred cow is too strong a word, but it was something that politicians on both sides of the aisle tended to believe that this was something that shouldn't be uh, tampered with by the IRS because – People felt it was only fair that they had already paid taxes on all this money as they had accumulated it in some form, and that now they're being taxed again. So they felt that that it it just didn't seem fair. And there seemed to be a certain unanimity among all classes of people that this is something that, that it's not fair to double tax when people pass on. That mood, I think, has changed in the last 10 to 15 to 20 years, especially the last 10 years, where you know we've had Occupy Wall Street. We've had a lot of di- discussion about inequality. Now, recently, there's been a lot of di- in- discussion about the fact that people have advantages by virtue of their birth. And, and there's just this, this um, quasi-socialist mood uh, over a substantial percentage of the electorate that I think this is something that rather than becoming uh, a relatively safe harbor among all of the candidates for taxation, I think this now has shifted to being a more vulnerable, even a symbolic target. It, let me make clear, the amount of money involved here is never much more than, it's less than 5%. It may even be less than 1%, but certainly it's less than 5% of, of the revenues of the federal government. It's not a significant amount uh, of the, the revenues. Maybe it's at closer to 2%. So we're not talking about something that has great practical value for solving social problems and paying for the many things that we've spent money on and the, our deficit that we've accumulated over the past uh, one year especially, but five years. Uh, this is not the candidate for a practical solution, but this has huge symbolic value. And symbolism, I would suggest, to, of this administration is perhaps more important than substance. And I think that, that it's very conceivable that in, a, in an administration that um, – that has has proclaimed its determination to to provide as much financial or outcome equality as possible. This would be a nice target, and we could very well end up going back to the one million dollars. I remember we were at at one point around two thousand two thousand and one. Yeah, maybe not the six hundred thousand, but maybe down to the million dollars, and that starts to hit a lot of people when you think about four hundred one k's, the value of your house. Right. Uh, recognize that we're going to have a substantial amount of appreciation in the real estate market over the next several years. I believe, and I think many of you listening can find that very believable. And when you advise that, um, you know, it's wise to reevaluate your estate plan, you know, should Biden uh, succeed in carrying out this proposed uh, tax plan? Absolutely. So if you think that you're going to be impacted even remotely um, by the reduced estate tax threshold, then you need to come in and talk to your attorney and we can see about adjusting your estate plan to accommodate that and shelter as many assets as we can to keep that tax bill as low as possible. So there's ways to do that, I take it. Yes, there certainly is. Um, some of the favorite ones that we have right now um, are to set up an irrevocable life insurance trust. That's one easy way where you can still have control over all your normal daily assets. But if you have an insurance policy, you put that into an irrevocable trust with its own separate um tax entity reporting to the IRS. And then when you pass away, your life insurance policy pays out to that trust and it's not considered part of your gross estate and therefore it's not subject to um, estate tax. So your life insurance policy is going to pay the taxes after your death, correct? Not quite. So um, 
the IRS looks at the total value of your estate when you pass away to see if it's over this estate tax threshold limit, which we mentioned is $11.7 million right now. And it could be much less in the future. Um, instead of having a large insurance policy that might be for a million plus, um, putting you over the edge into that 40% tax bracket, you put that insurance policy into an irrevocable trust, and that way it's not counted towards your 11.7 or whatever it ends up being million dollars. Now, are you hearing from clients of concerns about this? I mean, wanting to come in and reevaluate their plan? Occasionally, we do have someone concerned that has mentioned the lower estate tax threshold right now. But since this is just theoretical, no one has made any changes right now. We are thinking about changes, what we can do to help our clients. But until we know what the number is, we can't do much about anything right now. But it, it seems like it wouldn't apply to say, a middle-class individual. This would more apply to the very well-to-do. Am I mean? Am I correct in reading it that way? With it, the estate tax being at $11.7 million, that would be correct. Yeah. If it's dropped, though, it could impact middle-class families. Uh, yeah, well, that's true. And the fact is we don't know. If there's momentum that develops over the course of, say, the next six months, and I think that that's when we will start hearing some indication in debates in Congress about what's likely to happen from a tax standpoint. If people sense that there's going to be a substantial reduction from these historically huge uh, exemptions that we enjoy now, then they're going to be interested in considering transactions that perhaps they would engage in now that will allow them to lock in benefits. And that that's where we mentioned earlier about irrevocable trusts. Sometimes they are designed to be a sort of tax haven. And uh, in order for us to, to qualify with the IRS rules, it means that there has to be some meaningful way in which that trust is irre irrevocable and that the person does not have the same control they had over assets before they transfer them to the trust. It doesn't mean that they can't get benefits. It doesn't mean that they can't have some control, but they there has to be a meaningful loss of control. We won't get into that, that technical discussion. But the bottom line is that that allows people who, for example, think that an asset is going to appreciate a lot, then there's, there's often an advantage to having that asset transferred into this separate irrevocable trust that allows them to lock down all that gain in value that might occur. Somebody starting a business that, that they expect to gain substantial value, or perhaps it's a, it's a business that's small at the time. It's perhaps been around for less than five years, and they expect tremendous growth. Uh, soon or over the next five to 10 years. And those are people who may want to think about the implications because I can tell you that when someone has a business that goes that, that goes into a probate estate and they get tagged with like 50% or 45% of a tax on that, you can see how that could actually mean the death of a business. Now, thankfully, there are some special rules that allow people owning farms and in some cases small businesses to pay out their taxes over a period of, for example, five years or 10 years, I think, is, is the current payout period in which they pay equal installments over that period of time. So there, there are some, some relief valves uh, that, that allow people to perhaps limp along with the business rather than simply shut it down. But not everyone qualifies for those, incidentally. And those who do still have a crisis to come up with the amount of taxes that they're going to have to pay those installments over whatever period of time it is. So taxes can mean uh, selling a farm. If it doesn't qualify for these, it can mean closing a business or being forced to sell a business at, at a fire sale price. So a lot of people realize that, that if they don't plan in advance, and you don't have to be rich if you recognize the possibility these exemptions can be lowered. Uh, if you don't plan, then it could mean that that something that your family perhaps has owned and worked on for many years uh, could be jeopardized. Now, what if getting back to the businesses, say you have a small business and you want to leave it to someone, say perhaps somebody that works in that business and someone that's not related to you. Um, if you don't do it the right way, there can be challenges, correct? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's it's a very complex thing whenever you're leaving a business, uh, and it's beyond the exemption levels, uh, which, as we've discussed, we don't know what those are going to be. They could be, uh, 
I wouldn't be shocked if the Biden administration took those below a million dollars, and that would cover virtually any significant business, probably has a value of close to a million dollars. It's not unusual today. So what type of trust would you want to have in order to accomplish this with, you know, transferring a business to a non-relative after your death? Well, or does it matter? Yeah, this can get very technical. Um, and the reason I say that is that whenever you're you're choosing to make a transfer like this, you can have your cake and eat it too to one extent. And I realize I'm starting to walk into the woods here for our listeners, so <laughs> I'm mindful of this. I'll, I'll try to stay on the periphery. It's possible for you to make a transfer that's considered meaningful for purposes of estate planning, That's one tax regime. In other words, a set of rules that govern estate tax, gift tax. That has its own kind of set of of, uh, provisions. And then another part of the tax code relates to income tax. And it's possible to thread the needle between those two, meaning to keep keep the asset that you've transferred to the irrevocable trust as something that's taxed to you personally at your rate. And a lot of people choose that. They want to have it continue to be taxed to them at their personal rate. And at the same time, um, according to the estate and gift rules, you did surrender control. You did transfer it. And for their purposes, it will be regarded as as something that belongs to to the trust. Uh, so it wouldn't be part of your estate. It, it wouldn't be in your estate at all. It would be owned by this irrevocable trust. What, what the uh, estate tax regime is considering an independent entity of you, whereas the IRS did not consider it an independent entity because it was designed to fail the IRS test, but not fail the test for estate and gift taxes. Now, I'm, I'll, I promise I'll drop this subject into the, the technicalities here, but I know there are some people listening who who followed what I said, uh, but I know many of you didn't, uh, and and that's understandable. You know, I want to shift gears f- here for a moment. I'm curious about something. We have talked on the show extensively about qualifying for Medicaid uh, with your estate planning. Now, is there any um, concern that with Biden's proposed tax plan that this could hinder, you know, someone with you know, someone that's well-to-do with their estate planning in qualifying for Medicaid at some point in their life? Well, I don't think we want to call them well-to-do, meaning that it's true that you can have assets and still qualify for Medicaid, but I wouldn't go so far as to say well-to-do. I think people who are worth, let me take an easy one, people who have assets over $2 million, I generally don't think it makes sense to do Medicaid planning. Uh, And even if it did, I don't, our clients generally don't feel comfortable with that. And and it just um, it doesn't seem to be worth the effort. For for people who are worth less than two million, if whenever you said well to do, if you would in, if you would have included somebody as low as eight hundred thousand dollars or okay. seven hundred, sure, yeah. So so yeah, for those people, we'll say people who have assets and they want to keep them for their loved ones, and middle class for sure. And and I think one point five million is probably middle class. If for people to have accumulate that over a lifetime, right? And and you know, I mean, they're blessed for sure. But I think that still, that might be considered something that a lot of people in the middle classes have accomplished. So for them, uh, might they want to qualify for Medicaid? Yes. And and how does that affect their planning? Well, it depends on how they get rid of their assets. Um, sometimes they'll foolishly just give them away to people uh, with maybe some sort of verbal agreement, which. If, if it were enforceable, it would be fraudulent, uh, but it's probably not enforceable, which means they did give it away, but there are a whole lot of problems with that. Sure. Um, but some people choose, though, to move it into an irrevocable trust. On this show, we've talked about the irrevocable trust device as a wonderful tool for that. And Missy, I'll hand it off to you because you can explain this well. Sure. So when people plan for Medicaid, um, they need to get all of their assets down below a certain amount of money, which is currently $5,000 in Missouri. So if you have $800,000 and you need to get down to $5,000, that's a lot of money that needs to be um, put away in a way that doesn't make Medicaid upset and punish you. 
giving it as a gift to your relatives is one way that will make Medicaid mad and give you a punishment period where you can't get on Medicaid even if you have $5,000 or below. So estate planning attorneys have various ways that you can go about getting rid of all of those extra assets in a way that makes you shield as much as you can from Medicaid. So one of those popular ways, as mentioned, is to set up an irrevocable trust where you put your assets that you don't need for your day-to-day living on into that trust. And after five years, Medicaid can't see that you put that money in there anymore. So they can't count it against you. And, And it should be mentioned that that trust, though, is an example of what I was talking about a while ago. It's possible for the IRS to say, no, that's not a meaningful transfer, so we're going to tax you as if you didn't transfer it. In other words, there are not two tax returns, um, and that's what most of our clients want. Uh, so you have the best of both worlds. The IRS says it's not a real transfer. We're going to treat it as if it's your own. Meanwhile, Medicaid says, yep, yeah, we see that as a real transfer because you've given up some amount of control. You've met our conditions and requirements for us to not consider that your asset, which is exactly what you wanted. You don't want the Medicaid to, to say these are your assets after you transfer them. And introducing a third regime here, the rules governing estate and gift taxes, it turns out that according to those rules, you did make a gift which is what you want. So you kind of have the the best of each of these three worlds. You don't have a separate taxable entity for income tax, so it doesn't affect any of that. You you achieved your goal of having this asset not be yours for purposes of Medicaid rules, right? And you also achieved your goal of getting it out of your estate. Now it belongs to what is a separate trust. Right. And it won't be taxed as if you own it, even though the IRS, for your income tax purposes, said you did own it. And, you know, I think it's important to note that you're not hiding these assets because, you know, as Missy said, after five years, Medicaid won't be able to see those assets. But you're not hiding them. What you're doing is perfectly legal. Correct. Yeah, and and we have to emphasize that. Um, There are lawyers, none that I know personally, but there are lawyers who, who really cross the line in terms of trying to avoid taxes. That's a real risky bet for a client to make, to sign on with a lawyer who's going to play it so close to the line that there's a good chance they're going to end up on the other side of it because both the client and the attorney suffers. So um, our approach at Cordell and Cordell and Tucker Allen and reputable lawyers that I know is, is to be safely on this side of the line. Do everything we can fully, confidently do that we know is legal. Do all of those things. Be very aggressive in using the law where you know you're within the safe zone. But keep in mind, you should avoid any lawyer who says things to you that sound too good to be true. Right. For example, if a lawyer says to you, look, you can qualify for Medicaid by transferring all of your assets to this trust, this irrevocable trust, and there are no limitations on the way you use the money. No limitations. You can reach in and grab it and do it, anything you want, just as if you had not transferred it there. That doesn't meet the sniff test, meaning the IRS is willing to have provisions, and many call them loopholes, but they're not. They're usually not a loophole. Occasionally they are, but usually there's something that was thought out and was intended to be permitted for various reasons. It's beneficial to that industry. You know, it could be politics. It could be lots of reasons. So... When you have a provision in there that that says you can use it, then you want to take advantage of those things. But but it doesn't it doesn't meet the sniff test when somebody says to you you can lawfully use something any way you want and still get the full benefits. You expect there to be some limits, but those limits are not so bad. Incidentally, if you you know if you do everything the law permits you to do, then it turns out that you can enjoy some of the benefits. You can have some control. But not all the benefits and not all the control is if you didn't transfer it. Uh, I know all of us want to think that that we can engage in transactions through our lives that are of that nature, but we know the real world's not like that, and the IRS is certainly not like that. Right. So uh, you should be suspicious of something that promises you everything without any any concessions on your part. But can you transfer things to this entity and, and avoid estate taxes and to qualify for Medicaid and, and not adversely affect your income taxes? Yes, you can do that. Uh, but it does require some planning. And as you point out, there is a five-year look-back period. 
Uh, it doesn't mean that 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 it can't be seen or that you're going to deny a transaction. No, you, you're happy to proclaim that you made a transfer five years ago because you know it's beyond the boundaries of what the IRS rules permit them to consider. So there's nothing secretive or anything that's under the table here. This is all using the law fully to your advantage. And can I uh, mention in here... One of the downsides about putting something into an irrevocable trust is sometimes you lose out on benefits. Oh, yeah. So, for example, if you have an asset that is has appreciated a lot or will appreciate a lot in the future, that may not be the most suitable asset to put into an irrevocable trust, which has a lot of benefits, but this is not one of them. So... If you have an asset that we know is going to appreciate or has appreciated a lot already, when you pass away, that asset gets a stepped-up basis if it's included in your estate. Ah, yeah, yeah. So what are we talking about, like real estate? That is a big one. Um, Or if you have, like, for example, stock in a small business that really took off, um, where you paid a whole lot less for it than what it's valued at right now. When you pass away, the IRS gives your beneficiaries, so your family, your kids, um, a valuation that's based upon the time of your death. So you don't have to pay taxes, capital gains taxes, on that increase in value. People are going to be pulling their hair out now. I, I just, I mean, what you said, point, it need to be mentioned. Uh, but now I feel like we've got to explain, because I said a few minutes ago that one of the advantages often of an irrevocable trust is that if you think it's going to really increase in value an asset, uh, such as a family business or whatever it might be, it often makes sense to go ahead and put it in the trust and then let it gain all that value because when you die, it's not in your estate. Remember that to trust that it's considered that it was a real transfer. And so the the uh, IRS, for purposes of estate get and gift tax, it's not in your estate. So you avoid that what at one time was 55% tax and even what I think is proposed by Biden is 45%. However, as you point out, now, now we have to shift gears and think about income taxes so if we are just thinking about that appreciation and value, let's use a piece of real estate. So you have a piece of real estate you think is going to increase a lot. You're 60 years old. You fully expect to live another 30 years, which you should. I mean, medical science being what it is. So, so you're thinking, wow, this is going to go up a lot in value. I think I'm going to go ahead and put this in an irrevocable trust. I'm going to let myself have the income. You know, you'll pay taxes, et cetera. But I'm going to transfer this to this irrevocable trust because I think that this, this apartment building is going to be worth two or three times its present value when I die. And given the trends we talked about a few minutes ago, remember, I mean, we, you can expect estate taxes to go up and the exemption to go down is my bet. So looking into the future, 20, 30 years, does it make sense if we're thinking about estate and gift tax to move it into that entity? Yes, it does. Now, you just raised another point that confused people because you said, well, but remember that if it's not in the trust, if it's in your estate, in other words, it's you, not this other entity you created. It's, it, it's in your estate. You keep it in your estate. Then what about income taxes? It's true that if you don't put an asset in a trust and it's in your estate, in some sense of the word, it can be a revocable trust, incidentally, uh, but you transfer it, guess what? You get a stepped-up tax base, basis for income tax. And I know this is confusing to you guys, but you have to recognize that there, these taxing regimes are two separate set of rules. One is for income tax, the thing that we're most familiar with, and the other is estate and gift tax. So you dodge the bullet on the estate and gift tax on this appreciated asset, but it means that if it goes through a regular estate and say that that the asset was had gone from 100000 to a million, which is not crazy at all for that period of time we're talking about. So it goes up to a million dollars. Well, if if it had gone through your estate, it would have gotten a new valuation of a million dollars. So that means if you had sold it the next month, you would pay zero taxes because its basis in that asset has gone all the way up to its value at the date of your death. So that's a big, big advantage of having things go through your estate. It doesn't mean it goes through probate, incidentally, but it goes through your estate, such as a revocable trust. Um, that's one of the huge advantages. So you have to weigh those things. Um, on the one hand, you're looking at 
a it could be a capital gains rate tax, which is lower than ordinary income tax. But if we believe Biden and maybe the next several administrations may become more um, equality focused and we may see a more exacting or even more punitive rates on higher income, and we might see capital gains as a different set of rates disappear, and it may all become ordinary income. We don't know yet, but I would bet more on that than I would in the next 10 years rates going down. I don't think that's the mood or the temperament that that we're feeling right now in the streets, so to speak, uh, across the country, especially over the past year. So if you believe that, then you know that that income taxes can be harsh. But we also have talked about the fact that estate and gift taxes can be harsh. (laughs) Picking up with your point, Missy, is, and I'm glad you brought that up, is that um, we do have to keep our eye on both income tax impacts as well as impacts on the state and gift. And it's very difficult to have our cake and eat it, too, in both respects. But there are some sophisticated tax planning techniques that I want I won't even broach in this discussion today. There are ways in which you can, to some extent, have the advantages to both. Uh, But you have to keep your eye on all these factors. And it does require, you know, some some reading of tea leaves. And we all need a crystal ball to be able to plan (laughs) this perfectly, which we don't have. But these are all things, though, that it's not just a shot in the dark. We have a feel for what the mood is. And the good thing is, as long as you're alive, you can come in and tinker with your plan. Correct. I mean, how often does that happen, Missy, right. that somebody comes in, we have one plan in place, and then 10 years later, they they come in and say, wait, wait, some things have changed, or maybe we've notified them that some things have changed. And we come in and we, we adjust the plan a little bit. Rarely do we throw a plan out. That's the good news. But sometimes we'll adjust it. Does that ever happen, though, where uh, you start from scratch? Not too often. Usually what we do is um, the only one that jumps out at me is back in the 90s when they had such a low estate tax threshold, people had what was called AB trusts, where they would split up the assets upon the first spouse's death. Um, and that... The second spouse, the one who's living, couldn't get access to some of the assets of the deceased spouse anymore. Um, And given that the estate tax threshold has increased so wildly, many people have come in and we've started from scratch with a joint trust that doesn't divide up when the first spouse dies. So that's one of the big changes that has happened, but that trend might end up being reversed if the estate tax threshold goes back down again. I hope those clients aren't mad at us that they they originally came in in the 90s. We do something and they end up, um, you know, I mean, after all, at, we did planning based on a $600,000 exemption. So so we create these very complex plans, what we're called an AB trust, among other things. And uh, then, you know, the last five years or so, suddenly that planning is irrelevant because now we're at, if it's a couple, 20, like we talked about, 22 million bucks Mm -hmm. is exempt. So we throw out the complicated plan that they paid a lot for, uh, and we we go with the plan you just described, and they're going to really be mad at us if they come back in another if they have to come back and say another five years and we've gone all the way back down to a million dollars because we'd want to go with a similar plan. Now, the good news is this doesn't happen very often. So those of you who are thinking, oh, my gosh, I, I, I should never go in and do estate planning because I'm always going to have to turn around and spend the money again. Um, that That's really, as you said, it's not typical. And even in those cases, though, the amount of money that these people saved in those two scenarios, granted, we had to change the plan, but if they had died after the first plan, they would have saved a ton of money. Right. And then and then if they die after the second plan, they're much better off with the change. So it, it, it's always, for lack of a better word, it's always profitable if you have any assets to speak of at all to do your estate planning. And and I would say this, if I was, was not involved in estate planning at all, I would still say that, that go to a lawyer that does a lot of it does this exclusively, I would say. Uh, go to only lawyers who are doing this this area of the law exclusively, and, uh, and, and rarely, rarely will you not be f- much further ahead than the amount of money you spend on it. Think about the things that you do in investment for a 5% return. I wonder what the rate of return is for estate planning. I wish I could give you a number, but it's <laughs> incalculable. Yeah. I mean, think about that. How much trouble 
do people go to to figure out a way to add 1% rate of return to their assets? How many hours of research and do they watch CNBC and, and these talking heads, none of whom know what's going to lie around the corner? Right. And, and we, they spend hours on these financial networks pursuing a 1%, 2 3 4% rate of return above market. And, and yet estate planning is something that, that they will ignore when the potential for gain is so many times more than they could hope for from an investment. Yeah, yeah. And two, you want to review your estate plan every so many years t- anyway because life events. You could remarry. Um, you know, you may have um, – a grandchild that came into the world that you want to leave something to. I mean, there's so many different scenarios. Yeah. I mean, divorce happens. Uh, Cordell and Cordell will tell you that. Yes, you would know. (laughs) It's frustrating that guys and Cordell and Cordell, as everyone knows, represents guys, probably 98% of the clients at Cordell and Cordell, I'm guessing. So guys will um, find themselves in this situation where they're, they've just completed a divorce at some point, they're worn out, they're often, their liquid funds are often gone, some of it, of course, to their lawyers. Um, they probably didn't get everything they wanted. Rarely do in divorce, does either side get everything it wants. Um, but, uh, but but the, the goal was for them to emerge from this, to have the ability to pick up their lives, to create a new household. You know, now remember the same incomes that were funding one household are now fund, funding two households with those children at both households, essentially, if you think about it. Sure. even Even if, you know, naturally, physically, they're only at one household at a time. But because of the fact that throughout the year they're going to be at both, the reality is you're maintaining a household of, of one parent and the children two times. Uh, with the same combined funds. Uh, so even with child, with child support, with maintenance, that which may or may not be an issue depending on who's paying and who's receiving, um, it, it's really difficult to go to these guys and say to them, as our lawyers do at Cordell & Cordell, you know, they, they as it's only responsible of the lawyer to say to their client at the end of this long, unpleasant, expensive, draining process, to say to them, you know, you really need to go in and do some estate planning now. Your life has changed. Circumstances have changed. You need to go in and and take care of this. I can tell you that based on my experience with a lot of clients at Cordell & Cordell, they don't want to do that. They don't want to do that. Uh, they, they figure we'll get to it eventually. Sometimes eventually never happens. Yeah. Uh, but... But I understand that the last thing they want to do is give more money to lawyers. So, um, yeah, but things happen. And when they happen, maybe you're stressed out. Maybe you're depressed. Maybe it was a tragic development, whatever it was. It could have been the death of, 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 of a spouse. It could be lots of things that can happen where you need to pick yourself up. And among the business items in your life you need to take care of is estate planning. And it's a shame that it doesn't occupy a position at the very top of the list of things to do when you have major crises or changes in your life. Um, we better wrap up. Uh, w- we didn't talk about gift taxes, Missy. Say something about gift taxes real quick before we wrap up. Sure. So every year you can give away up to $15,000, you as an individual, and if you have a spouse, that's doubled to any specific person. So if you have three kids, you can give away up to $15,000 to each of them. And if you're married, your spouse can match that as well. So if we're worried about an estate tax limit, that is one way to reduce the amount of your estate and not have to pay extra taxes is to periodically gift every year $15,000 to your kids, your grandkids, um, other people like that, that you want to have a benefit of your wealth, but do it before you pass away. Does it have to be a relative? Could it be a close friend? Absolutely. It could be anybody. You could give away your entire fortune. And uh, it would not count as a gift or a state tax. So, mm. so if um, if Bezos were to give away his what one hundred and fifty billion dollar for no is it yeah one hundred fifty billion yeah billion if he were to give that away 
and distribute it to, to where it assures that no person gets more than $15,000 in a year, then uh, he would have no estate or gift tax. So there, th- this is nice, and, and too often people confuse this, though, with the income tax regime. Remember, these are two sets of rules. They both are taxes, and they both are, are governed by the IRS, but still uh, the rules governing income tax are entirely separate from the rules governing estate and gifts. So the, the $15,000 exemption that people have heard about uh, is just with reference to estate and gift tax. I, I don't know how many times people say to me when they're thinking about lowering their income tax, they'll say, you know, I can't give but $15,000 away. I say, no, 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 that's, that, that's not relating to your income tax. It's relating to your estate and gift. Income tax rules are separate regarding gifts, and we won't get into that. However, I think that we did cover a lot of territory today. Certainly did. So I guess we should wrap up. So this has been another episode of Elder Talk. Till next time, take care. You've been listening to Elder Talk with Tucker Ellen, providing intelligent answers for those thinking about their future with attorney CPA Joe Cordell. Sponsored by Tucker Allen, your estate and elder law advisors. For more information, visit TuckerAllen.com. Listen again next Saturday for another edition of Elder Talk with Tucker Allen. The choice of a lawyer is an important decision and should not be based solely on advertisements.